Super. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, uh, meeting on U Forum, RIUF, Romanian International University Forum. My name is Tudorel Popescu, and today I have the pleasure and the honor to have with me Charlie Otley. The, um, Hello, our... Tudor. <laughs> Good morning, Charlie. How is your tea? Fantastic. I have to start the day with an Earl Grey tea every day. It's a, it's a religious experience for me. Uh, the day doesn't begin until the first or even sometimes the second cup of tea. So, <laughs> how, how, would you find, how would you define this religious uh, experience in terms of uh, the approach to the tea? To the well, it, I, I'm joking, of course, but for the British, uh, it's a bit like the Italians with their coffee. You know, you, you, you don't feel you can actually adequately start your day full of, you know, righteous confidence and uh, energy unless you've had at least one cup of tea. So I have a kettle by the bed and the first thing I do is I make a cup of tea, black tea, Earl Grey with milk. And uh, after that, then, you know, that, that puts you in the right mood for the rest of the day. <laughs> well, I, I just pretend that I have my tea, but I have coffee instead. You have coffee. Well, it's a, it's a strange thing that, you know, there's a, an English expression that everything will be all right if you have a nice cup of tea. It makes everything better. I always imagine if there was a three minute warning and uh, all our nuclear holocaust was looming, that the British would think, well, that's just enough time to put the kettle on and have one last cup of tea. <laughs> So we, we are really glad to have you here today in our uh, morning session on New Forum, Romanian International University Fair. We have, um, we are live now, live on YouTube, live on Facebook. So we, um, we think that our public would like to know more about you, about your story with Romania. And of course, why not just to um, highlight a little bit the experience with flavors of Romania that is now- on Okay, sure. And, uh... Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I first came to Romania in 2010 uh, at the uh, request of a friend of mine, uh, Paul Lister, an environmentalist uh, who has plans to try to reintroduce wolves to the Scottish Highlands, which is meeting with mixed reactions from the British public. But um, we used to have wolves until the 1600s. The last one was killed. And uh, he said, come to Romania and see what Scotland would have looked like 500 years ago when it was still covered in forest and we hadn't cut it down due to shipbuilding, uh, the Industrial Revolution, clearances, etc. And, uh, and see a, a, a really pristine landscape with apex predators still running wild. So I, I accepted, of course, and came over here and fell in love with it straight away. And... You know, here you've still got the forest, you still have the, the bears, the wolves. We haven't lost those things yet. And uh, I wanted to make a film about this for the Travel Channel, because at the time I was a, a presenter for Travel Channel. I'd been doing a series called Flavors Of all over the world. We'd done Flavors Of Chile. We did Flavors Of Spain, Flavors Of Peru, Flavors Of Mexico, uh, Flavors Of Greece, uh, Colombia, Scotland, and South Africa. And there were six episodes on each, and this had been running for about 10 years on Travel Channel. So I came over thinking, well, maybe Flavors of Romania. But then we decided to do something different. We did Wild Carpathia, combining conservation with travel, which is something that doesn't necessarily go easily together. I think the Travel Channel were a bit nervous about it. And then Prince Charles very kindly came on board and gave me an interview for the film and cracked a few jokes. Uh, which was very kind of him because it meant that the, the, the film got seen and quoted in places like uh, Australia and America, Sydney Morning Herald, the New York Post. And uh, the, 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 the documentary ended up going to 111 countries worldwide. So it was massive and translated into 10 different languages. So this, this became the first film that we did in Romania. And then there was an interest on the part of the government to do two more. So we got sponsored by the tourist board and they tried to stifle my conservation uh, stories because they didn't like us showing the negative side. But I, I really feel if you want to understand the country and you also want to care about it, you've got to show the reality of what's going on. And Romania is a very beautiful country. It has the last great mixed forest left in Europe. It has two thirds of Europe's apex predators. And um, 
you know, it has the most biodiversity, I think, probably of any country in Europe. And this was such a wow. And, and I wanted to show people, first of all, the beauty, but then also the jeopardy and, uh, and make them care. And this, this is the recipe that we devised and that went on to make four more. We had Wild Cup Avia two and three, and then we did Wild Cup Avia Seasons of Change. And um, we've just recently finished White Cup Avia a year ago. And that was Romania in the wintertime to demonstrate that Romania is a destination that people can go to any time of the year. And it's equally beautiful in the winter, even though it's freezing cold. And I mean, we were up in Toplitsa in minus 20, tracking wolves in the snow, knee deep, you know, getting up before dawn, sitting there with a camera and you're not allowed to move. So you've got to hold the camera and it's freezing cold and your skin is almost frozen to the lens and the tripod. And you, you just almost can't breathe in case the wolves hear you or they smell you or they see you. And uh, we did this for days and days on end. I've never been so cold in all my life, but we, we got a chance to show this wonderful landscape through the, the winter months. And we ended with the guilloche, the snowdrops of spring, but otherwise the whole landscape was in snow the whole time. So that was a really tough project, but it was a beautiful thing to do. But in between that, as you know, because that's when I met you, we did Flavors of Romania. Yes. And um, so you mentioned Toplica. Is that in Hargita area? Yes. In Hargita, yes. It's, uh, it's one of the less well known and discovered parts of Romania. And yet it's also, Hargita is the wildest, I think, landscapes in this country. You know, you have hundreds and hundreds of square miles of beautiful forests and loads of wolves and bears and lynx. And uh, there's not a lot of intensive agriculture going on. So it's still got traditional landscapes. So you maintain the biodiversity. I was up there about uh, six months ago. We went up there for my birthday. And I am starting to see fences going up around around the area. I mean, this is something that I think is 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 happening systemically across the country. People are getting agricultural grants, and part of the money they receive goes to fencing off their land. Now, I mean, one understands that because you don't need so many shepherd dogs if you've got an enclosure. Uh, but it also does a lot of damage when you put too many cattle on that land. For example, you get intensive grazing, and in order to get the grass to regrow, you need to use fertilizers. And that kills the mycelial networks, the mushrooms, the mycology. It kills a lot of the biodiversity, the more sensitive plants, some of the orchids, things like this. And, and we lose the beauty of these unspoiled landscapes. So that's a problem and that's happening a lot. It also changes the brand that we established for Romania as a sort of wild corner of Europe, where you can gallop a horse across open pasture land and countryside, or you can go mountain biking or you can go hiking because now there are fences across a lot of the bridleways. In England, we have the Ordnance Survey and they um, actually document footpaths and you're not allowed to fence over the footpaths. But I am finding in Romania now, the fences are crossing uh, rights of access and cutting off local people from their land. Um, big companies are doing this to, to mass produce cattle. And uh, it's, it's, it's slowly changing the shape and the identity of the countryside here and making it much more like Britain. Where, where you're finding loads of hedges, loads of fences, and it's very hard to, to walk across this great open landscape. It's also very bad for bears and for wolves and for animals that migrate long distances because of course they get stopped by a fence and they can't go any further. So Charlie, I have a very good question related to this from yep. our um, uh, most probably an, an attendant in our meeting, um, yep. which is a fan of your documentary, Flavors of Romania. Yep. So for people who want to get involved in preserving the local environment, what are your top choices, like organizations or movements? Okay, so there are, there are, lots, of, uh, there are lots of charities out there. I mean, it's uh, far bit for me to list them all now, but I mean, just to give you one example, for instance, um, if we talk about cultural conservation, um, and um, patrimony. Uh, there are a lot of monuments in Romania that are on the verge of collapsing and falling down. We, uh, we went and visited Baile Hakilani in episode six of Flavors, you might, might have seen. And um, the Imperial Spa is on the verge of collapse. And there's now a group of young architects who have got a fundraising campaign. We've been um, trying to help them pr promote them. And they are doing a really great job 
raising money to try and help um, protect or su su support this amazing building before it falls down. Um, but it should be something that's a priority for the government, you know, for the Ministry of Culture. We can't let these priceless monuments just fall into rubble uh, because we're losing a vital, vital part of Romania's heritage, its history, and also its possibility for, for tourism in the future. And this is something that people used to visit. The Imperial Spa was part of the grand tour, as I mentioned in the programme, where ladies of society would travel around the, Europe and go and see famous cities and galleries and learn and educate themselves by, by touring. And they came here to uh, Bali Herculane to take the waters. And uh, now, of course, when you see it, it's just a, a ruin. So one of the charities, which is actually um, um, uh, helped by Prince Charles, who's a patron of this charity, is the um, Architects Ambulance. And they do a fantastic job helping to restore old buildings free of charge with the labour and the local community just have to chip in to try to get the raw materials and then they bring a team and the team use the traditional materials in the right way to restore the building as it was when it was first built and this is a sensational organisation I think uh, and they've already saved lots of churches, lots of houses and monuments around the country that would have otherwise have collapsed by now. So there are always I think opportunities for people to go and volunteer there are tree planting charities. There are, uh, yeah, Via Transylvanic is another one. I mean, I'm a um, page great organization. It's run by Teshalas Social, um, and they have had a number of initiatives over the years, bringing truckloads of presents to the poor children at Christmas time, um, doing other, you know, charitable initiatives with kids. They have workshops. They bring, you know, 10,000 children have come through their door to see the living classroom uh, up on, on their land, up at Via Trans, up at Tashalas Social, rather. And they get to learn about conservation. This is something we need to be teaching in schools. Kids need to know more about um, eco subjects and, and, and conservation and, and the environment because we don't teach environmental studies in Romanian schools. And this is a great shame because we need to grow up with an understanding of man's relationship with nature. So they're doing a fantastic job. And they've also now built this walking trail that goes 1,200 kilometers across the country from Bukovina to Drobeta Turner Severin. And it's amazing what's happening because they're bringing tourists to rural areas and to villages that would never have otherwise seen tourists, you know, visiting. And so people are able to open up guest houses, they're able to open up little businesses to give tours, and, and it's, it's gonna rejuvenate, I think, uh, a whole tract of land right across the middle of Transylvania. So this is gonna be, you know, really brilliant for tourism and we need more initiatives like this, but they're always looking for volunteers as well. Uh, so I think if people want to get involved, the, the best thing you can do is either start your own initiative or go and help and work with an NGO uh, and ask if you can volunteer. I mean, there are initiatives you can do on your own. We, we did one um, a, about a year and a half ago. We did a litter campaign in Bran because well, apart from the fact that we've been living here, Bran is also one of the first points that people see when they come to Romania as a tourist. They go to Bran Castle. It's one of the top tourist destinations, as you know, in the country. And they get off their flight at Otopen and they drive up the Prahava Valley and they drive past Sanaya um, and Bushden and you see the river all the way along on the right hand side and it's clogged with rubbish and plastic hanging from the trees and it looks like an open sewer. Uh, in places and it's really really sad and so they then get to Bran they might see the castle and then they go walking up to the edge of Buchech and again the sides of the road littered with beer cans plastic bottles the river is clogged again with refuse and it gives the impression to foreign tourists that Romanians don't care about their country they have no respect for their landscape and hence very little respect for themselves. And this is the impression that it creates in the mind of a foreigner, which I, I don't want people to think because I love this country and I love the Romanian people. I think, you know, everyone here is so hospitable and so kind and actually, you know, really, really, they, they're very caring and, and fantastic people. But to foreign people coming in, this question of litter and trash 
is a big, big issue. And it does reflect very badly on the mentality of the entire country. So we did this litter campaign and we got the local kids from Bran to put on high-vis jackets. We spoke to the mayor and said, we need two rubbish lorries to come with us. And we mobilized a huge crew and we went up the two roads, Shimon and Puerta Street up to the ski slope in Bran, clearing up all the, tra all the trash from the sides of the roads and right up into the forest. We found old televisions, we found two, two toilets that have been chucked away. We found bags and bags of beer cans. People having picnics, they turn up, they have their little barbecue on the side of the road, and then they don't clear up their stuff and they leave it there. And then the bears come and, you know, it's a disaster zone. There aren't also, there aren't rubbish bins available for people to safely put their refuse in, bear-proof rubbish bins, in fact, or dog-proof rubbish bins. And so we, we just, you know, however hard you work to try to clear it up, when we came back six months later, the situation was the same again. So I think, you know, people having, uh, volunteering to try to keep their communities clean, even if we did it once a year and had a spring clean Romania, where, you know, particularly towns in, in rural areas that are, you know, beautiful and unspoiled. If we all kind of went out there and spent half a day clearing it up and shamed the city halls into doing more about it themselves, I think this would have a massive effect. Kids get involved, they do it, and then they go home and, and tell their parents. And then if their parents start chucking stuff off the side of the road, the children will, will hold them accountable. So, you know, there's a lot we can do ourselves. We can do our own initiatives, uh, or we can join other people's. But the main thing is, you know, to, to, to see what there is and to, to try to make a difference. That's an amazing initiative, Charlie. And I think that from our audience, uh, we have many young people around, so I believe yeah. that they will borrow this, this initiative. Well, in order to well let's do it. Let, let's clean up Romania because, you know, there are other countries where you don't have this problem now. I mean, it's much better in Italy, for example, and it's just a beautiful country for that. You don't, you don't, you don't notice it if it's not there, but you really do once you start seeing the trash. It, you kind of, you focus in on it. And once you've seen it, it's impossible to unsee it. And if you're coming from a country where there isn't a, a litter problem and you come here, you can't help but start noticing it. And then it's impossible not to see it wherever you go. And, and this is very detrimental to, to tourism for, for, for Romania. Excellent. So, um, Charlie, I have now a bunch of questions coming in. Yeah. So, uh, sure our meeting already. Well, one of them is, uh, how much time did you invest in Flavors of Romania? I had so, to you know. meet you in one, of the, uh, in one of the episodes, in fact, in Montaigne. And yeah. it was a huge experience, but I know that this took you uh, some years. So can you give this to the public? Well, I mean, if you remember when we saw you, um, we were first of all due to interview um, the priest and to go up and see the cave churches or caves, because I, I have to say they were around a lot earlier than the church, I believe. Yes. Um, <laughs> although I know, I know that um, many, many Neolithic, Paleolithic sites, um, you know, um, in, in the country are now also shrines. Um, and, you know, that, that, that is what it is. But uh, we, we came to, to film it and uh, then we met you. And uh, so suddenly, you know, we got chatting and I thought, wow, well, this would be a fantastic interview. So we did our interview. So that took an extra hour uh, or 45 minutes. And um, then we met someone else. So it, it goes like this. So you, you turn up at a place with a story in mind and then you meet people there and you find there's another story there. So what you think might take you half a day may take you three quarters of a day to do. And so the, the, the itinerary is always changing and usually expanding. So we, we took seven months to film, just to film Flavors of Romania. And we kept having to go back to places. If it was raining, I didn't want to show it because obviously this is something I'm hoping Netflix will extend across Europe. And if they do, it could be the best promotion for Romania abroad ever because there's millions of Romanians living abroad, the diaspora, who are asking all the time, can we please see the show? How do we get it? And we say, well, you've got to write to Netflix, fill in the form for Netflix. And hopefully if enough people do that, then there'll be a big demand and they'll decide, OK, we'll put it on in, in the UK. We'll put it on in Spain and Germany, et cetera. So if, if this happens, then, as I said, it, it'll be fantastic. But um, 
we didn't want to show bad weather. We didn't want to show the, you know, the downside. I mean, obviously I drew attention to issues because I, I care and I think we need to make people aware of these issues. But also I wanted, when we were doing beautiful locations, I wanted them to look beautiful. So it meant changing every day the itinerary depending on the weather forecast uh, and also whether I could get the bike out there because you can't ride a bike down dirt roads in the rain. So we ended up, uh, as I said, doing seven months and I drove the bike 20,000, roughly 20,000 kilometers in, in that period of time to get to all the locations we had to get to. And then editing wise, we then had to go back and we had about 10, uh, how many, let me think. Yeah, I would say nearly 10,000 hours of footage, nearly. I mean, with the, with, with the three, four cameras, rather, actually, four cameras that we had running each, you know, it was nearly 2,000 hours of footage for each camera. So if you imagine how much time that's taking to go through and find the shots for each episode. So we were, we were really struggling to, to, to not miss things because, you know, if you've got really beautiful images, you don't want to suddenly fast forward and miss that one and skip a few shots. And then, you know, you've left out something that looks incredible. I guess the edit was about four months to do, you know, in the end. Uh, and that was working full on. But uh, it was a pleasure. You know, it's, it's a bit like uh, going out, I suppose, what people felt in the old days about hunting. You go out and you catch your prey, you bring it back and you, you eat it. Uh, you cook it up and then you serve it. And, and for me, it's, it's, it's a hunting process when I'm filming because I'm going out, I'm, you know, grabbing fantastic interviews where I can and finding stories and, um, and filming and getting the images and capturing them and then bringing them home and then preparing them. For the, for the screen rather than the table and uh, then serving them up and hoping people like what they, uh, what they see. So it is rewarding and, and that edit process is great, but you do have to spend sort of, you know, 10 hours a day to 12 hours a day, sometimes stuck in front of a screen going through everything meticulously. I see. Well, I think that we satisfied the curiosity of our public. Now yep. I'm coming with the heavy artillery of questions. Right. Well, it's like if you want to change something in your life, Charlie. Yeah. What would that be? If I had to change something in my life, what would that be? Yes. Um, I think probably first of all, uh, it, it, this is a simple one, but I'm finding it quite hard at the moment. Giving up smoking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't know um, how much I would change, really, because. I don't want to sound smug, but I'm really happy with my life. I mean, I, I, I'm doing something I believe in. I'm getting up each morning with a purpose and a cause. I've been lucky enough to become a resident here. And, um, you know, I'm doing, I'm restoring the house that we're going to be living in at the moment. So I'm rolling up my sleeves and, you know, digging and uh, supervising and trying to get it all ready. And uh, this is a dream for me, a dream come true. And, you know, I'm here making beautiful films. I'm able to do something that matters. That I feel that, that that is genuinely helping. And this is a huge privilege and an honor. And I, and I don't think it's something that everybody has in their lives to feel that they've got a cause to fight for. I think we all need as human beings, a cause to fight for, to believe in. If we don't have that, then we're kind of drifting and anchorless. And so I think we need to work out what it is that we can do. I mean, we can't do everything. And, you, you know, some people are better at some things than other things. So we have to find out what are our, what are our gifts, what are our skills, develop those skills. Um, you have to specialise a bit to do so. I think you have to sort of focus on a few things rather than the general jack of all trades, master of none approach that I found the other day when I, when I got a plumber to do some work on the house and said he could do the building and the plumbing and I found that he wasn't really very good at either because he hadn't specialised. Um, and I, I think there's a tendency for people to think, well, we can be all rounders, we can do everything. No, we can't, especially not now when everything's so competitive. So find your strengths identify your strengths and identify your weaknesses and then you know focus on how you can use those to to push ahead with things that you feel matter in your life and this could be something that isn't about just your job it could be something you do as a hobby or as a, uh, as, a as a cause or a charity you work with or whatever but so for me I mean I'm very lucky I'm very blessed I've always wanted to be a poet and I've written two books and they've been relatively well received I think and I've also wanted to make a difference work as an environmentalist in some form and and been able to do that uh, and obviously to make beautiful films. 
So I wouldn't change an awful lot, you know. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't come smoking. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe one less palinka a day, you know. <laughs> I see that. So, um, Charlie, there is uh, a curiosity that I have. What yeah. advice would you give to our young uh, audience today related to how they can link the roots, yeah, uh, the areas, yeah. places where they are coming from with their desire to discover the world? Yeah? I think it's very important to see the world. I'm, I, I don't. You know, I'm not uh, an advocate of people not traveling. I've traveled, I've traveled, you know, to nearly 100 countries around the world. I've learned a lot. I had between university and starting work, I had a year and I bought a around the world ticket. Um, I saved and saved. It was about 2000 euros, I think. And I got seven stopovers in different countries. And then if I went overland, I could I could then take another flight from a different area and then that wouldn't be part of my flight so I ended up uh, hitchhiking you know across Australia for example and I'm um, doing lots of lots of different uh, bits traveling by bus and seeing places like Nepal and Thailand and uh, you know the states and uh, Latin America and Peru uh, and for me it was a big eye-opener but I think traveling helps you learn about the world it helps you learn about human nature what I found is that human nature doesn't change the way in which it's culturally expressed changes, but human beings are the same whether you're hanging out with the Mayans in Mexico or the Aborigines in Australia, um, and uh, you know, or or, or the, the the high flyers in Singapore. People are the same, but their culture shapes the uh, perceptions that they have, but the basic understanding and emotional responses and everything are the same. So you get to learn this. And that's a really, I, I felt a big gift from traveling. It enabled me to sort of understand people wherever I went and empathize with them uh, and learn about their cultures. But then you need to take that knowledge and you need to use it somehow. And and I don't think it's, it's okay to just sort of you know, forever kind of drift. I, I, I thought I wanted to take that and come back and do something with it, which is why I'm here talking to you now. And I, and I would advise people, um, you know, uh, students and graduates in Romania to, to travel, definitely, to go and see the world and get some experiences, some life experience, but don't abandon your country. I mean, I, I say that and I'm here sitting in Romania and I'm not in the UK, but then, you know, that's a slightly different issue for me because I didn't vote for Brexit. Um, and, uh, I, and I think Britain's doing well, hopefully will continue to do OK without, you know, a great deal of input from me. Uh, and there's not a lot we can change in a system like that. So, you know, I'm here. But I do think that the, the, the young here in Romania can do an awful lot to change the system here. And I think if we stay optimistic and um, we, we, we try to, to focus on a, 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 a future that is achievable uh, and, um, and, and not losing faith, then I think people can make a huge difference. And I think it's sad that a lot of uh, previous generations have just left Romania and thought, forget it, can't deal with the corruption, it's too, you know, the wages aren't good enough, this, this and this, rather than actually trying to help, you know, do their best for the country, take what they've learned and come back and, and, and help be part of the solution. You know, if we lose all, all our, you know, new generations and our most educated people and they go abroad, then it's really, really bad for Romania. And it, it allows this climate of apathy and corruption here to continue to endure and uh, that's that's going to be really very very bad for Romania. I see that it's this is an amazing advice and you cannot imagine how many questions do I have in here but we still have yes. time so what's the piece of advice that you can give uh, to our audience related to making a good documentary and then this is also related with the fact that some young people in our audience, they are asking you if you are willing to work with kids 18 to uh, 20. Sure. Look, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, here, I'm here talking to you now. Um, I've left my builders up at the house and driven back down to come and, and talk. I will always make time. You know, because it's really important and I want to, you know, help, especially people who are starting out to to develop the skills necessary to fulfill their dreams, because I was lucky enough to have people do that for me. And so, you know, I'm 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 available as much as I have time to do so um, for for anyone who wants advice or help. But, um, you know, the thing is, if you want to to pursue this kind of this kind of work, doing documentaries, for example, you need to practice, first of all, 
and experiment and uh, don't be frightened of trying yourself. You don't have to go and do a two year course. I, I learned everything I needed to learn by watching other people and working with other people. I started out just as a journalist. Um, in fact, actually, I didn't even start out as a journalist. I started out as a sales advocate or um, um, kind of classified advertising sales jockey, selling tiny bits of space in the back of uh, trade magazines for very small amounts of money and having to phone everyone up, cold calling, to try and raise money from a magazine called Retail News Agent, which was the magazine for shopkeepers. And I was responsible for trying to persuade companies to advertise to these shopkeepers in the back of the trade magazine. So that was where I started. I did six months of that. I went on and I became an exhibition sales manager. I worked in sales still, selling exhibition space, show guides, this kind of thing. And I was realizing that I wasn't making any difference to anybody except kind of taking money and helping people line their pockets and it wasn't doing any good and I wasn't able to be creative. So I, um, I put myself through night school at City University to study freelance writing for journalism, for newspapers and magazines. And then I walked out of a job, which was quite highly paid. I think that was, well, a lot of, quite a lot of money in a company car. I was about 24 years old uh, or 25 years old. Um, and I, I went to work uh, at the lowest, lowest end as a journalist for another trade paper, uh, this time for the jewellery industry, writing news and feature articles on fittings and fixtures for jewellery. Uh, <laughs> I did that for about six months. That's incredible. I have, I have one, one of my professional experiences. It's also within the, the high-end jewellery area. Yeah, there we are. Exactly. Horology, jewelry, all of this findings, the findings market. So I did this for a while. I did that for about six months. And then um, I got a job working for a news agency as a Hollywood reporter, first of all, as a feed writer and then as a Hollywood reporter. So I started writing news feeds, um, taking what the magazines had written about the entertainment industry and adapting them to make a story to put out on an international newswire. And after about a month and a half, the, the editor said, OK, um, love what you're doing. Would you like to be our Hollywood correspondent? And of course, I said sort of, you know, yes, but this blew my mind and I need a week to get my head around it. And a week later, they'd organized a visa for me. And I was on a flight to Los Angeles where I was helping to run uh, the L.A. Bureau uh, in Melrose Avenue. And I did that for about a year. And I was interviewing everyone from Marilyn Manson to uh, the cast of Friends, to Boyzone, uh, to Michael Douglas. And I was taking photos, so I was a photographer as well. And I was writing all about the sort of news stories on, on Hollywood. But it was, again, a bit parasitical. So I wasn't very happy about it because I was still like, well, you know, I'm writing about other people who are being really creative. And all I'm doing is feeding off that and reporting it for people to read, you know, in, in, in a slightly prurient way. So I remember when, um, uh, who was it, um, Matthew Perry from Friends, who had just come out of a period of time in rehab, uh, was going to the cinema and he, 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 he approached me and said, hey, you know, you've got, the, you've got the time. And I said, yeah, what film are you going to see? He said, Air Force One, that dates it. Uh, Air Force One. I said, well, your film's on in 20 minutes. Uh, and he said, cheers, buddy, and went into the movie. Now, I knew that my job involved, this would be a great story. It was a scoop. Right. So if I had a photograph of him out on the town with his friends, you know, um, this would be, you know, I'd be I'd be the golden boy with the news agency. Matthew Perry is feeling better and he's out on the town with his mates in Hollywood. Bang. It's a scoop for Paris Match magazine. And I couldn't do that. I just thought, well, I'm not going to go and get my camera because it's invading his privacy. And I really, really can't bear doing that. It's just awful and when I realized I couldn't do that job properly anymore and I didn't like it I gave it up and I came home and I became a poet full-time writing poetry for about three years and that was again a dream to do I managed to get a column on a newspaper writing poetry and comic verse for the news and then from that um, as a columnist for the Daily Express I told the Travel Channel that we could turn this into a documentary a uh, travel documentary uh, it was a travel column I wrote called The Weekender and they said go and make a pilot so I approached a friend who was a filmmaker and this is where it gets very relevant so look, I, I think I might be a presenter I don't know I think I could have a go at this um, if you do all the filming and I present and write it uh, can we make a pilot? It's not going to, you know, we have to do it for free because they, they're not going to pay me to make a pilot because I'm, I'm not tried and tested. Uh, but if they like it, then they'll give us some money and we'll be able to make a TV series. So this guy, Alistair Grant, said, yes, OK, we'll do that. And we spent four weeks making the pilot and we gave it to Travel Channel. And then they said, 
Right. Okay. Here's a um, hundred thousand, roughly. Go and make thirteen episodes of, of Weekend of TV uh, for Travel Channel, and that's really how I started. And that was my first job as a presenter. But I then learnt with watching Alistair filming how to use a camera, and I sat looking over my editor Alan's shoulder, learning how to use the edit suite. And so by learning from other people and changing direction over the years to find what I really wanted to do and what I knowing what I didn't want to do. I don't, you know, I don't want to do something that doesn't matter to people or to the world. I want to leave a mark. You know, we, we have a choice in life to leave a mark. I think, you know, we need to leave the world uh, a little bit better than when we came into it, all of us, even if it's being a teacher, which is a fantastic job and helping kids and doing this, or, or whether you're, you're, you're a therapist or whether you're doing something or a painter and you're inspiring people with your paintings, you know, whether you're, you know, whatever it is, there's, there's so many aspects of every job where you can help people. And I, and I just think that actually, this is the secret to a happy life. And um, we, we need to sort of find a way to do that. Well, this is, such a lovely session with you, Charlie. <laughs> so, I know I'm rambling a bit, but I'm trying to sort of give it some context. No, no but that's, that's so you. So you brought uh, identity aspects, you brought uh, life, happiness, changes, uh, policy, yeah. uh, and uh, part of your past. So what, one of the, um, uh, now one of the questions is, what's next on Flavors of Romania? Well, um, this yeah, okay, so there's two things. Right now, we're, we're going to be doing Wild Danube. So we've uh, raised almost all the sponsorship to, to actually start and make Wild Danube, which will be the next one from Wild Carpathia series. So it'll be probably the, I mean, we did five, and there's no more Wild Carpathias to be done, okay? Because we've done every aspect, every every area, um, every season, you know. Uh, but there is still the Danube Delta, which is, I think, one of the unique selling points of Romania. When we were doing our BBC campaign that we raised money for earlier in the year to run in June, and we, we screened four films, two one minute, two 30 seconds, right across Europe, America, and the Middle East. We tried to get the Ministry of Tourism on board. They had their budgets frozen. So we had, you know, supporters like uh, Associates and Eco Romania, Kaufland came on board, uh, one of your child media, all sorts of people came on board and we, they all gave 5,000 each. And we made this, this um, series of short films and put them out on the BBC. So um, when we were doing that, we were thinking about what is Romania's unique selling points? How do we rebrand Romania for the international market? So obviously wilderness, patrimony, yeah. I mean, history monuments are vitally important for this country, but as, you know, as foreign tourists, I think, you know, there's amazing castles in Spain, beautiful medieval villages in Italy. So the, the monuments here are, are, are great and they're part of the whole package, but I think we need to think more about wilderness tourism, biodiversity, that kind of thing. And also, you know, the Danube Delta. So the Delta is one of these unique selling points. No one else in Europe has a Delta, this, you know, like this. This is the largest wetland in the whole of Europe, and it's over 3,000 square kilometers, it's nearly 4,000 square kilometers, lakes, reed beds, waterways, beautiful bird life, everything. And it's under threat, again, from insensitive development, concrete, cement going up, and litter, trash, and pollution, um, all, all these things. And yet it's still, in many places, a pristine and beautiful place. So we wanted to do Wild Danube as the next one to show the world what I'm going to rebrand as the Amazon of Europe. That's, that's my tagline. I think this works really nicely because it captures the vision in people's minds, foreigners, come to the Amazon of Europe. You know, see this landscape. We start at Christmas time. We stay with a fisherman. We, we, we have two Christmases because we get to have the Lipovan Christmas as well. So, you know, that'll be fun. Juana loves Christmas, so she gets two this year. Um, and um, we're going to start filming uh, uh, December and then we're going to go right through till June. And uh, we're going to catch the changing seasons. We're going to get the life of the fishermen, seeing them fishing on the ice, making the hole in the ice. And then we watch the ice melt and the birds arriving and the landscape transforming from silver to green. And, and we'll show all the beauty. We'll look at some of the conservation issues and we'll wow everybody with, with uh, the, the Danube Delta. Uh, and, and we can use this and make a film from this, another one minute film for the BBC, which we can show across Europe and tell everyone, look at this, you should come here, yeah? Wow, the Amazon of Europe. Is, is this the official launch or not? Um, I guess we've mentioned it in passing, but not really. So yes, you can say this is the official launch. Um, we, um, 
we uh, have uh, Unilever as a partner for helping us because of course you know we we can't you know we have to get funding for these films right so so we have to approach companies CSR because otherwise they don't get made um, and uh, we've got the Noble Heart Foundation on board we've got uh, Unilever on board hopefully we'll get another sponsor because then we can make DVDs as well to give away to schools I want to like we did with uh, White Carpathia where we had a crowdfunding campaign to raise money for for dvds uh blu-ray we then invited people to to um donate to buy a dvd and we would eat, what we did is we match funded them to give one to the school of their choice so this meant that well people bought a dvd for whatever it was 15 20 euros we then sent one free to a school that they have picked in Romania. And we want to do this again on a bigger scale and do a Blu-ray with Wild Carpathia for White Carpathia and um, Wild Danube on a, on a Blu-ray DVD. And, and we want to send it out to all the schools in the country to be using as a kind of educational tool, as uh, something to inspire them with the beauty of nature, you know. Amazing and inspiring, Charlie. So Thank you. I, I have a very particular question coming from yep. the audience. What's your favorite city? I know that you, you that's not a, a, a... No, I know, I know. Um, okay, so I, I was recently hugely privileged to be made an honorary citizen of Brasov. But I, I've always maintained, you know, I love the whole country, loads of locations. I don't have a favorite and I, I don't know if I could pick one. I, I've traveled, okay, I, I'm gonna make a confession here. The only, the only, city I haven't been to is Aradia, really. Um, and I, I need to remedy this with Flavours too, because I think we're going to, at this rate, with you know the success that we've had with Flavours of Romania, we've had uh, chats with various people, even the tourist board about this, to try to raise the funds to do a second one. Um, there's a load of locations that we can put in. We found incredible new places since that, the making of that three years ago, almost four years ago. Um, and I would love to be able to revisit, take the bike out again, go to some more off the beaten track locations and, and feature uh, towns and cities that we haven't been able to include. So we'll never go to the same place again. Uh, unless it's been a massive change and see how it's changed in that time. But uh, so to, to say cities, I mean, I love Timisoara, I love Sibiu, I love Yash, uh, I, I love Cluj, uh, Targa Muraj is nice. And, you know, Brashov is fantastic. You know, there's places all across the country. I, I, I don't really, it's impossible for me to say, because uh, I find I've got friends in all these places and, and, and you know, I travel so much. Yeah, so now you also covered the next question. Yeah. So when, it's, when it's flavors of Romania too coming? Well, if we can, if we can get the Wild Danube project finished, uh, at least for, you know, the most part, um, half the post-production done, the shots sorted, so we know we've got everything. We, we will have that done by hopefully the end of June, beginning of July. I, I'm, I'm hoping that by the 1st of August, will be free to film for a couple of months. So we'll have to fast track it a bit because we won't have the seven months we had before. But uh, if we do, we can maybe still make four or six episodes of Flavours uh, for season two. And I'd really, really like to do that. I'd love to have the time to do that. Otherwise it would have to be the, the following year. But uh, we, we've, um, we've got some ideas we've been writing down. So we, we, we will be working on that and trying to raise the funds to do it because there is, I think there'll be a demand. And I hope Netflix will, will have worked out that it's sufficiently successful for them to have had it on across Europe. And then we can do a sequel and then that will go across Europe. And there won't be anyone who isn't familiar with Romania by the end of it who has Netflix, which would be just fantastic, you know. Fantastic. So I have a very good film director in Shirna that can help you with that. His name is right. Dragos. He will be on his way to help you for the next. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So, well, I'm just going. I'm going back up there later to continue the building work. So I'll invite him around for a, a palinka or a cup of tea. <laughs> so uh, well now because we still have few uh, uh, just few uh, few moments uh, for, yep. uh, for our um, uh, morning session. It's like, uh, what is your motto, Charlie? Uh, what are the rules that you follow? That, that's the uh, quest. Now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> rules are. Um, let me let me give you um, uh, let me give you a poem 
uh, I wrote for that, um, which I think kind of encapsulates it for me. I mean, it's like this. Never leave the page unfilled, for life is brief and must be sought, embraced and faced and chased and caught. So milk each moment, lest you find the future's all you've left behind. So love and shout and share and build and never leave that page unfilled. Oh my God, this is- Does, a... that, answer, does that answer your question? <laughs> Fully <laughs> and completely. No, <laughs> Charles, this is amazing. I, I think that I, I was the lucky one this morning to jump into this session with you uh, after, uh, well, our last meeting three years ago. Yes. Uh, so wh what's the next movie in which you will place me? Ah, when are you coming? Well, um, that, we'll have to talk about that. Uh, maybe, you can, uh, maybe you can come and talk to us um, in Flavours too, because um, we will obviously be revisiting each region. I'm sure there are lots of other incredible locations near your near your family home, but uh, I don't know about. So uh, I think you're gonna have to tell me that yourself. <laughs> okay, so I, I, will, uh, I will gladly plan this. Um, let me see, just to the question. Uh, okay. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Good. I'm happy with tough questions. If, if there are any tough questions, please, you know, uh, what, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever feel like giving up your dreams? There is, a, a, there is one of our a, a young person here asking. Uh, and uh, how did you uh, do to overcome this? When, when... Uh, there, there, have, there, have been, there have been moments. Yeah, sure. There have been moments when I have. There have been moments where I've been profoundly depressed, um, where I've locked myself away and um, sunk into box sets uh, on television. And... Um, not really gone outside almost. I've been really, you know, low when we've been broke. I mean, at one point we were in England and we didn't have enough money to get to the shops to buy food. I had to rely on friends, you know, helping me for a few weeks because we were so broke because we'd spent so much time fundraising, driving around, having meetings out here to try to make a production that never happened or didn't happen that year. Um, and we were sunk. Um, and this was, yeah, this was actually before White Carpathia. And, and there were a few months where it looked like I was going to have to sell my house in England to stay afloat because I didn't, ha and, and, you know, I didn't have any, any, any income. And I was, getting, I was getting hit with bills I couldn't pay. And we couldn't even, you know, we couldn't even feed ourselves at that point. And there have, there have been moments in my life like that where things have been tough. And, um, you know, even recently. And, and you, you do, you need to step back from it, but you need to get some distance from it. For me, I read a book as well, because books are really good. They, they transport you. If you're feeling down and you're depressed and you sink yourself into a book, it's even more uh, liberating than a film because in a film, you're still looking at it two dimensionally across an open space and uh, you're not in it. Whereas in, in the book, you're actually living and breathing what you're reading. So I read, you know, all sorts of books. I, I have a, a Kind of guilty pleasure in reading science fiction and fantasy books and uh, I, I transport myself away from my problems and and I come back and I have a fresh mind um, but sometimes it's taken me a few weeks or even a few months to struggle to get over things you will always have this this will always happen to people but the thing is it will always get better you know one has to think that actually you know when it seems bad now it's probably going to be better when you're when you're well rested um, when you're focusing your mind to resolving the issues and when you don't run away from them, when you confront them. It's all about not being fearful, losing the fear and actually directly greeting or meeting your, your issues, your problems that you're facing head on. Because, you know, but you can still take a few days off. They'll be there when you come back. If you need to get some space, don't feel guilty about it. You know, Rome never gets built in a day. So, I mean, that's, that's my philosophy. And, uh, you know, I had a mother who was um, a Tasmanian sheep farmer's daughter who was very practical. And she always said to me, you know, you ain't got it that bad. You know, 
look at those people. Look at the starving Ethiopians in, in you know, in Africa when when I was complaining about not finishing the milk in my bowl of cereal. Or look at the other people who've got real problems you haven't. You know, stop being so selfish and thinking about yourself. Go and help someone else. And and I think in a way that's a really good rule of thumb as well. If one's feeling low or one feels that you know you're struggling with issues. Try and help a friend, you know, try and do something for somebody else. And it me immediately makes you feel better uh, and, and it makes your problems seem much smaller uh, and, and the burdens and the, the difficulties you have to overcome seem, seem a little bit less. Oh, my God. Overwhelming uh, statement, Charlie. Thank you very much. I think that this is my pleasure. our audience. And uh, because we, we are at the end of the, at the end yeah. of the I would like to uh, to say once again for our public, thank you, Charlie Otley. We well, have... thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank yeah. you for putting up with me for, for nearly an hour. And um, thank you so much for this interview. We, we are in this uh, session of uh, U Forum, the part of Romanian International University, um, um, University Fair, which is one of the largest in Europe. And um, Charlie, um, you... You've been amazing this morning. I would like to do the closure with a message that you would like to leave to the uh, to our youth today, because we have okay. lessons, having a look. Yeah. Uh, okay. So my message is very simple, very very quickly. This is very important. Believe in yourself and believe in your country. There's a lot of cynics out there. There's a lot of people who seek to undermine people who are doing good charities organizations and people who are trying to help romania and there's the, there's a lot of this cynicism inherent in the newspapers and in the way romanians are being taught to think if we're all too cynical we don't do anything we get apathetic about it then we permit this existing culture of corruption and apathy to continue we have to believe and we have to do something um we have to care Otherwise, we won't change Romania. We won't take it forward. It has so much going for it. And I believe that with everybody's help, we can do a lot. But give everyone a chance. If you've got a new mayor or a new politician, give them one chance at least. You know, give everyone a chance. Try to, to enable, you know, progress. Um, and don't read, uh, ideally, you know, too much into, I, I, I guess, the, the, the dark conspiracy theories that we get in this country all the time. It's not always the case. You know, we, we sometimes things are just as they are. And I think we spend far too much time worrying about, you know, whether we're being lied to or not. And I understand why, because the press have lied, the politicians lie, but we can't change it if we don't start believing in doing uh, something ourselves to change it. So let's get off, uh, our, you know, our asses, get up there and do our best to, to, to reach, you know, help Romania reach its full potential. And thank you. And um, uh, thank you for listening. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Charlie. We do the closure by telling, uh, uh, well, we will, I will share something with you. The audience said, we love you. Oh. Thank you very much. And uh, back at you all. Back at you all, really. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye, Charlie, dear. Bye, okay, merci. Bye.